It's a <clears throat> very rich uh, and quite a vast array of subjects and uh, themes, but of course, uh, all the papers link very nicely uh, to the main, main topic of our uh, discussion today. So, uh, I have, like Laura said, I have two hats. I'm, I'm both a policy researcher at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, but also a practitioner, uh, having served uh, with the United Nations and also with the Finnish government in, in quite a number of conflict areas ranging from Cambodia, Palestine, Afghanistan, and so forth. So many of the uh, places and situations that you talked about, I can, I can relate also from, from practice, but um, let's see, uh, <clears throat> I'll try to go through some all the papers and have some specific comments. So I did not prepare a, a statement, like because I think we have been in some of the panels and some of the discussions have sort of prepared um, statements, and I was wondering, you know, they were not talking about the papers at all, so I rather want to focus on, on what, what you guys said. First of all, uh, Sarah, uh, elections, uh, highly relevant indeed. Uh, I, I worked with the United Nations in Cambodia in the early 90s with the United Nations Transitional, Transitional Authority in Cambodia. And, and I, I, can, I can relate very well to, to, to what you were talking about, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the power play of the elections and, and the really long and rocky road to peace. And of course, we have these situations in many, many other instances also. Uh, there are sort of four issues that, uh, that uh, came to my mind. Uh, first of all is, you know, in these situations, how a post-war polity is constructed. And of course, the notion of post-war or post-conflict is a bit problematic, particularly in modern times when we have an interplay between sort of uh, no peace, no war, and something in between. Uh, going back and forth. And then, of course, touching with the whole question of dealing with the past. And, and then, then that links to the point on, you know, how do you obtain an inclusive peace? Because if, if you don't uh, have the perpetrators and, and the sort of uh, warring parties on the, on the same table uh, and, and coming with a new political dispensation, you will be back... Uh, to conflict, but but it, it, it's it's a really hard uh, and difficult uh, discussion, and I think it, there's, the experience varies also from setting to setting. And then with the elections, uh, the timing, the question of timing. Uh, again, going back to uh, <clears throat> Cambodia and my own experiences, I, I really liked when you you used this term uh, restrained uh, Leviathan, because if we look at Cambodia today. It's become an autocratic uh, uh, hegemony, or sort of a closed uh, democracy in different terms you can use. Uh, but <clears throat> this is a good uh, example, the Cambodian experience. Um, the, the war is over, uh, the violent, violent conflict is over, but yet uh, you have an autocratic leadership uh, in, in place. And, and this seems to be, in many other instances, often the the, 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 the situation that, that unfolds after, after, after the, the electoral process. But yet, I would underline uh, from, from my own experience and understanding is that um, it's, <clears throat> you really have to have, in order to have, have, uh, achieve uh, inclusive peace, you, you have to have all the um, uh, protagonists around the table and, and, and some very difficult choices and, and compromises need to be made and, and then, then the whole justice debate comes into to, to play and how, how do you figure that into the equation and of course this demography is, is also uh, comes to play because then you with time uh, you have a new new age cohorts entering <clears throat> entering the, 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 the situation and uh, the, the past becomes uh, more distant but yet it is present in the collective consciousness of, of the polity uh, Isla uh, on, on power sharing, yeah, well, interesting stuff. Uh, also, uh, on, on point on international and the role, role of international actors. I recall from Nepal, uh, which, which is a good example, actually, uh, of, of a situation where uh, UNMIC, uh, after the peace accords of 2006, was really instrumental 
in, in, in a, you know, pro be, be, being, a, being a stabilizing force. It was a political mission rather than a peacekeeping mission, but nonetheless. Uh, and of course, we have, we have different situations where uh, either the UN through its political missions or the peacekeepers are present or the African Union or OSCE and what have you. And, and then the question uh, remains uh, <coughs> that, uh, to my mind, uh, many of the situations are sui generis, uh, th their own. So the leverage and the incentives and carrots that are available seem, I wonder whether they seem to apply only to particular situations where, where, uh, where, th where there's more to lose or more to gain. Uh, from 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 uh, by by the, the powers that be, from the international community that are involved, and whether it would actually apply to situations where 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 the international community does not hold much sway. Uh, the question about um, citizens and how how they affect this, uh, the the situation. I, I find it very interesting when you say that citizens uh, ratify the elite deals. Uh, that, that's that's really fascinating perspective and perspective. And I was just wondering, I mean, what about you know, how do you, how do you see the role of civil society, advocacy, NGOs, human rights NGOs, the media? I mean, do they have any role at all in this? Uh, <clears throat> and, and then, of course, uh, you were talking about Colombia. I don't have experience on Colombia, but isn't that a very sort of relatively homogeneous situation? So, I mean, how how would this apply to to, to situations where where the uh, the, the ethnic makeup and just the, the social makeup, social fabric is much more complicated. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, I'd be, be interested to hear um, about, um, because you do not talk about civil society at all, just sort of the citizenry at large, and how, how people actually uh, feel about being being or not belonging, the question of be belonging or not belonging to, to, to the polity that is being constructed. Uh, Mara. Well, <laughs> when do closed camps become a prison by another name? Yes, uh, this is a fascinating file. I, I know the Al Hall file for uh, working with the Finnish government, and um, that's a difficult one because uh, <clears throat> I actually uh, agree 100%, 110% with all your conclusions that, of course, there's a question of uncertain legality. The whole whole international law, how does it apply? And uh, from uh, terrorism research and uh, talking uh, and we're working with colleagues in the intelligence community, uh, there seems to be a concurrence or sort of a common understanding that uh, these closed uh, camps, such as Al Hol, are actually a radicalization hotbeds, and hence, at least in in Europe, in Europe. Most of the intelligence agencies are of the opinion that yes, we need to bring uh, uh, the, the the European citizens out from places like Al Hol because <clears throat> it's 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 a bad investment in terms of future if if they just uh, remain there and uh, and of course then, then this question of human rights uh, come comes to this uh, the qu whole question of warehousing. I mean, I, I served as the <coughs> deputy. Uh, rep of Finland in, in Palestine and <laughs> Gaza, yeah, Gaza, <laughs> talk about where, warehousing uh, uh, of a whole, whole big population, so uh, yeah, fascinating stuff, I mean, uh, I don't know if I really had any questions, but I was basically just concurring of, with all your, your, all your points, but good. And then Erika, wow, this is uh, also interesting uh, paper that you presented, and actually I make the opportunity that um, just today, uh, me and my colleagues uh, from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs just uh, published a working paper uh, titled Un Understanding Non-State Armed Actors, Forces for Good, Evil, or Something in Between. Uh, people who are interested in this can find the papers there uh, on our website and also uh, a few papers uh, by the table down there. But anyway, uh, yeah, whether, yeah, ALP, I, I, I also served in Afghanistan, so I, I remember the ALP, uh, Afghan uh, local police, uh, uh, tribal mobilization forces in Iraq, and then Syrian 
armed group dynamics. I mean, today, uh, these kinds of uh, actors, they have really become standard, uh, yet very versatile protagonists in, 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 in modern uh, asymmetric uh, conflicts uh, that we have been seeing since 9-11, actually. Well, now the situation is, we have a new twist with the Ukraine file, but that's, that's something different, I think. Uh, one of the issues that sort of uh, sprang to my mind was that um, many of these unknown state actors, uh, what is the process? How do you see how, how they become you know, part and parcel of local governance structures? Because they often become them. I mean, outsiders create them or help foster them, such was the, as was the case in Afghanistan or Iraq or even in Syria. But then we, we uh, also face this situation where, you know, it becomes, uh, particularly in the Syrian file, uh, but also in Afghanistan, I saw, they become like, you know, we create this Hobbesian sort of everybody's war against everybody else kind of situation. And um, uh, how, 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 how can you, you know, what, what's your thinking about, you know, um, the SSR process, I mean, are they part and parcel of the security sector reform at all? And, uh, or should they be DDR'd? I mean, uh, and uh, I just, and uh, now that we are sort of, if we are moving uh, with the Ukraine file to a sort of new era of, of warfare and conflict, I mean, do you think that um, these, these kinds of armed non-state groups, uh, are they th things of the past or are they here to stay and how, how you see this uh, file evolving? So uh, I think I have actually used my time, but they were sort of just thoughts that sprang to my mind when I was listening to your fascinating papers. So looking forward for a discussion, thanks. panelists, presenters, including Sarah. I'm happy to see that you are still online, still very early in the US. And, and of course, uh, thanks to Olli also for his, for his comments. I think they very nicely complemented, to, complemented your, your papers and your arguments. Now we have about 15 minutes for, for questions and discussion. So please, the floor is finally yours. I don't know your name, so I'm very sorry. I have to sort of unpolitely, impolitely point my finger. So, gentlemen, there in the... In Thank you very much. Andrea Ruggeri, University of Oxford. Uh, question for Sarah. The first question is about the possible issue of ecological fallacy. If you can tell us a bit more whether, for instance, those that were not victimized but are surrounded by those that were victimized actually are more mobilized to vote for the perpetrators in order to be then eventually um, uh, defended by the, the new government. And if you can also elaborate by the, the two by two table, that was extremely interesting, but of course you were running out of time. Um, I couldn't understand where the violence was in that table. So I could see the balance of power and the pure lo uh, winners or the mixed winners, but not uh, the violence. On Ayla, uh, quickly, one provocative thought. So in these matters about power sharing and after uh, conflict uh, issues, would you say that citizens don't matter because are the elites and the, and the affiliation and affinity toward the elites and eventually matter? And going less provocative, um, I saw your results. I was wondering why there was heterogeneity between Santos and Uribe. If you can tell us whether it is a story of incumbent versus opposition effect, or if there is something else. Uh, thank you very much. Perhaps we take another two, and then so Sarah has time to, 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 to think of her reaction, and, and also Ayla. So uh, there is at the back. My, uh, size and length helped. Hi, uh, really wonderful panel. I have a couple questions. 
as well, uh, many, but I'll just launch a couple and I'll try to be brief. So um, for, for Sarah, if I understand your logic correctly, it's a very provocative argument, it um, should only, you know, they're given, the belligerents are given military, they're given credit for militarily winning. So shouldn't this whole argument only hold in conflicts that end in military victory? and not in conflicts that end in negotiated settlement. And do you test for that? And then also, maybe I need to read the book, whole book to get the, 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 the feel, but it felt like you were saying it was a perception, not a reality of that the groups have, the winning groups have this confidence. Like, I find myself wondering about that. I mean, to win, especially if they're like a rebel group, they do build this confidence. They often build a, something like a state and they get deliver services, they gain control, they become powerful. You know, I think of groups like Hezbollah in the Middle East that, I mean, there's, there are reasons, it's not just a perception and a heuristic that people then support them. And so, I don't know, but where you fall on that. And then for Isla, um, uh, quickly, I was wondering, a, you know, you, you sort of suggest citizens um, don't matter because they're susceptible to cues. I'm not sure that is what the Americanist political scientists who rely on that, those cueing experiments say. Um, they, in some sense, they, I think, have a defense of sit rational ignorance among citizens and that how they use these informational shortcuts but are still able to express their... So I was wondering on that and then also, does it hold among communities that are more on the front lines? Um, and I, yeah, as uh, equally. So thanks, yeah, I'd love to hear on, on all that. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think that we give the, the chance to Sarah and, and Isla to, to, to uh, react to these questions and then we take a few more. But I don't want to keep you from, from your lunch. So the next set of questions, please keep them short. So Sarah, go ahead. <coughs> Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for these really probing um, and thoughtful questions and for engaging so productively with my my research. Um, first, I just want to say I completely agree that for peace, we need to have all the protagonists um, at the table. And as Isla's um, fascinating work has shown for peace, we also need inclusive elections. Um, and so I do want to just say that there are glimmers of hope from, from the work um, and that it's that by including these protagonists, you're not necessarily doomed to have um, only peace and, uh, and necessarily trade off everything else. Because what I find is that former abusers may engage in regressive justice in the short to medium term, but as peace consolidates um, and citizens start to gain breathing room from heightened insecurity, um, there do seem to be possibilities for justice that grow. Um, similarly, in the governance domain, um, while there do seem to be trade-offs with respect to social welfare, um, the citizenry does seem to gain in the near term in the domain in which um, the belligerents have a comparative advantage um, and, and competence, so in the security domain. So there are glimmers of hope from, from the book. Um, so going to this um, really great question about ecological fallacy um, and whether it's um, just the, I, I do think of um, citizens emerging from war in the types of categories that you're laying out as direct victims, um, con people who are conflict affected by war, but are not its direct victims. And then arguably, um, and depending on the nature of the of the, the geographic nature of the violence um, and the ethnic nature of the violence, you might have um, what are plausibly non-affected, non-victims. Um, and in my work, I especially in my survey work, I'm able to um, I was able to interview direct victims, conflict affected. Um, non-victims and also this um, category of non-affected non-victims in order to try to address some of these um, issues that you raise. Um, and I certainly think that the, I, the um, conflict affected non-victims are among, um, are, are often prevalent and can be um, the swing voters, the undecided voters, um, for whom a lot of these strategies work most effectively. And I'm not saying that all vote victims will vote for 
um, their perpetrators, but rather um, try to understand this especially surprising pattern that any would vote for um, their perpetrators. Um, going to the two by two, my, my, my talk um, at this hour was definitely too, too long um, for, for the time given, um, but I'll just lay out um, quickly what, where the, the source of instability comes from. And, um, and the security voting does give war winners a sort of upper hand in elections. Um, and so these militarily advantaged belligerent parties um, tend to be not only good at tying their own hands, but they can deter their opponents from remilitarizing. And so the key point is that if the balance of power after war remains unaltered and this, these election results reflect the power balance, then there's little reason for either the war winner or the war loser to reinitiate violence. And so then you get peace and um, but if the balance of power instead inverts, meaning that the militarily weaker is now stronger, the fact that the population uses the heuristic of war outcomes to guide their vote means that they're now choosing a, a weaker, a now weaker war winner. And so the electoral results are misaligned oh, with military you. power um, and the newly empowered belligerent should be incentivized to return to war. So that's the, that's the dynamic. Um, there. And then in terms of military victory versus negotiated settlement. I'm very sorry, Sarah, but I have to ask you to wind up because uh, Isla is still, uh, um, you know, two people are waiting for, for, for answers to their questions from Isla. And then I'd like to ask for, give a, a chance for oh, other yeah. people to ask. Okay. So, yes, well, I, so, uh, yes, I, do, I do look at uh, perceptions. Directly. These are such thank good you. questions. So, so thank you so much. And I look forward to much, many, many more discussions with this group. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So Ayla, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, so I'll try to keep these brief. Thank you so much uh, for the excellent uh, discussion questions and questions um, from the audience. So thinking about this, um, you know, I think I intended to be a little provocative because there's been so much focus on citizens in this conference. And I think that there are lots of roles that citizens can play, of course, but this doesn't seem to be one of them to me especially because of the affinity divides that often sort of characterize these post-conflict contexts, right? If we think about these citizens as really stabilizing sort of an elite divide and being willing to punish either side if they violate the terms of the peace agreement, that's a big ask from like a group of citizens, right, who have been participating in or at least affected by a civil conflict up until that point. Um, and so this is, this is meant to be provocative. So I'm glad Andrea responded with a, a provocative question uh, of his own. I'm happy to talk more about that because I really do think that these, these are usually divided societies and that's what sort of prevents them from, from having you know, a, an, a, this particular effect. And I think this also gets to our discussions question, which is like, what is the role of civil society, NGOs, the media? We didn't find an effect in the survey of providing additional information or providing information from a non-political cue on these sort of uh, uh, people's attitudes, right? And so those didn't seem to have an effect. Whether or not they might have a direct fact effect, um, civil society, for example, might be a balancing factor. I think we need to think about what kind of monitoring it's providing and what kind of incentives it can provide to sort of change the incentives for the different combatant parties. Um, it would certainly be an interesting thing to study. Why the difference between Santos and Uribe? In brief, I think there are two answers other than Uribe's charisma. I think one is that um, the camps are very different. So the people who are aligned with Uribe on this issue seem much tighter on the right, whereas from our survey where people are aligned with um, Santos seem much broader, but they support the peace process, right? So they may not be getting as much from his cue because they're not as tightly aligned. The other aspect is that the Uribe cue may be more surprising because this is essentially a revision to the peace process. And so showing that he supports this aspect when he opposes, oops, opposes the rest of the peace process may be especially surprising information. So we're guessing it's one of those camps or surprising information as to why the difference there. Um, and then the other, uh, the other questions in terms of citizens um, don't matter um, because they're susceptible to cues. I don't mean to suggest that citizens don't matter or their preferences don't matter at all, but that they don't seem to be serving this, or they don't seem to be likely to serve this stabilizing function given that they're sort of splitting into camps on this issue. And so they're not going to be very likely to sanction sort of the side that might renege on a peace agreement. We do have a paper that's about to come out in JCR um, with the same co-authors that shows that um, the elites, the politicians, parliamentarians, don't 
take uh, citizen uh, opinion into effect very much on these policy cues. So we actually were able to survey the, the parliamentarians and ask them about their positions and whether they would update them based on information from the Colombian voters, and they didn't. Um, so that was, was very interesting. And we don't find strong differences in communities on the front lines uh, as opposed to other places, but I'm happy to talk more about that afterwards. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Now uh, it's five to one. And, and so I would take two more questions. Please uh, be brief, then, uh, then, then, uh, then you can also hear the answers. Thank you. So this uh, gentleman here in front, I think he was first. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, Benjamin Pedrini from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. I have a question for Erika. Um, in one of your implications, you, you said that uh, you were asking how do these mobilization, if these mobilizations and um, cooptation initiatives affect the state building goals. And so I want to um, ask you to the extent that you see a relations and something that e echoes what Oli said, a relations between these mobilization and then relations with uh, uh, other functions of governance in, um, in other, yeah, social services, et cetera. Um, and, and the second is uh, if uh, these efforts may actually, in certain cases, reinforce actually fragmentation of security, and instead of supporting state building, they may actually go the other way. Thank you, and then there was one uh, just behind. Sorry. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Graham Blair from UCLA. Um, for Mara, um, I was wondering if you had any observations from looking at the, the camps that closed in, in the data set that you have and whether there were pathways to closure that were kind of relevant for the current set of camps, and in particular, whether any of them uh, faced the kind of um, security threats to recruitment and, um, and mobilization that, and, and then resolve them effectively. Thank you. So I think the first was to Erica and then to, to Mara. Erica, go ahead. Right. I, it's a great question. I'll take it from the back. So in terms of increasing fragmentation and how that might be in tension with other state building goals, this is often front and center for why states might try to encourage them to be institutionalized, so to take non-state actors and, and attach them either in a parallel force or in some way under the Ministry of Interior or some other state force with the idea that if you're putting them under the state authority, you know, one, you can be seen as positive. You're, you're disarming or reintegrating in practice armed groups that are otherwise not corralled under state authority into it, um, and that you're preventing the risk that you're then ceding more competitors to state authority. But what tends to happen in practice is that you're, you're only doing this because you're already dealing with really weak institutions that aren't able to exert coercive power over these forces. So that doesn't really tend to change with the institutionalization. So you still get the effects that you may actually still be empowering and mobilizing groups without actually having that sort of taming influence. You know, you usually get one of two things happening. Either, you know, you've got sort of your elite captured corrupt institutions and then it's attached to these community groups and just sort of filters the dysfunction down to them or you get a situation where the militias are then embedded in the state institutions, and rather than that being a controlling force, they're able to use the legitimacy and the resources of the state to sort of buttress their opinion. So it does, that's been the most common result. I'll just leave it for that, given brevity. Thank yeah. you. Marco. Thanks so much for the, the question, Graham, and, and this is um, a great idea. So in this, this is a very early stage sort of data collection, and I haven't looked in uh, detail into sort of the other, um, other ex most examples of camps that have been closed, but I do know um, that there were a number of uh, closed camps in Iraq um, that closed, and, and I think the, the, the main distinction or the reason why it was relatively easier for these, Iraqs, uh, these, these Iraqi camps to close is because the entire camp population was in Iraqi nationals, and there was relative success. There was both sort of a screening process to determine criminal liability in which you know some residents of the camp were then referred for prosecution and the rest were, were kind of allowed um, to return to their communities of origin. Often that needed to be facilitated by various tribal justice mechanisms to overcome sort of community resistance and stigmatization. Um, and uh, or in other cases relocated to third communities. But I think why a whole is particularly challenging is because of the um, the the number of different nationalities represented um, and sort of the unwillingness also of, the, of their their countries to to um, to repatriate them, which in turn then sort of the confinement of, of third country nationals with Iraqis and Syrians 
trans is resulting in, you know, I mean, hundreds of children being born every year now whose um, nationalities are totally uncertain and don't have a clear path. So I would just say, I mean, the one of the mechanisms that's been suggested for as a sort of possible solution to all hold that I find really problematic is is for um, the court system of the autonomous, um, you know, the Syrian uh, 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 autonomous. Um, Kurdish administration to claim jurisdiction over prosecutions of uh, you know people from Europe and other countries um, uh, under you know a legal system that that is quite flawed and, and doesn't have a sufficient number of lawyers for for these cases and and you know I, I don't I don't see that as particularly viable but I do think that this is one of the most um, sort of pressing long term challenges of how to um, basically yeah how to how to deal with this population of third country nationals whose um, countries aren't willing to take them. Um, whereas, you know, there has been some successful uh, reduction in the, in the size of the camp population through um, re return and reintegration of Syrians and Iraqis. Thank you very much. I, I, I saw that there was one more question, but I think that we, uh, we, have, to, we have to leave it at this. I would like to, to thank all the panelists and the discussions uh, once again. And obviously, thank also the audience for, for very, I'm sure that we could have continued for another half an hour. I hope that you are able to continue the discussion uh, in the margins of the conference. Very rich indeed. Thank you very much.